Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our uh, first virtual launch of the IMD 2020 World Competitiveness Rankings. A few hours ago, we have made our rankings public, and they're already making the headlines in different countries. Um, I am here with my three highly distinguished colleagues uh, and friends that we are going to be discussing the context of the uh, rankings. And let me start by introducing them before uh, giving a few words about the rankings this year. Um, Her Excellency, Dr. Ayman al Mutairi is an Assistant Minister to the Minister of Commerce in Saudi Arabia and also the Director of the Saudi Arabia National Competitiveness Center. Uh, and as such, also a partner institute of the IMD World Competitiveness Center. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, Diego Molano is a, an IMD MBA graduate, but also the former Minister of Technology and Communications of Colombia. Besides that, he's the president of the board and board member of many different organizations, including, for example, the International Telecommunications Union, or, for what matters to us today as well, the Competitiveness Lab of the World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome, Diego, as well. Thank you for Thank being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning from Colombia. Thank you. And finally, Alexander Stab. Alexander Stab is the director of the European University Institute in, Floren in Florence uh, in its School of Transnational Governance, actually recently appointed, uh, uh, roughly one month ago. He's also a former prime minister of Finland, uh, of course, I am the alum, why not to say that, and also distinguished Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Uh, good afternoon, Alex. Hi, hi. Nice to see you. Thank you for, be for being here. Uh, just three headlines about this year's ranking. First of all, we saw in our rankings that the first top economies in terms of world competitiveness are small economies. The ranking this year is topped by uh, Singapore, followed by Denmark, and the, top, the list of top five countries is also Switzerland, uh, Hong Kong, and the Netherlands. So that's our first finding that I am willing to discuss with you today. The second interesting result this year is that both the US and China, the largest economies in the world, are suffering, and they jump positions down. The US goes from number three to number 10. China goes from number 14 to number 20. So this marks a new world in which, and that's the third result that we find, in which deglobalization, the importance of national governments, has increased. And uh, as a result, the global powers that have been competing for some time now, they lose ground in favor of small economies and, again, national, national government. That's something that I would like to address with you. So the way we're going to structure this webinar and this roundtable is that I will ask a few questions to our panel members, and then we will be opening the webinar to questions from the audience. So you can use the chat that you have available to ask our questions. My colleagues here are going to feed the questions to me and I will bring them to, to our distinguished participants today. Um, Dr. Raymond, let me start with you with the, with the important question for, for us. What do you think that uh, are the measures and the reason why Saudi Arabia has been so successful in competitiveness in the last years? I must say that, you know, Saudi started at the bottom of our list only four years ago and has increased to become this year the country number 24 out of 63 countries in world competitiveness. Who do you think they are the key success factors for Saudi Arabia? Thank you, Arturo, and uh, thanks for all our audience for attending this session. I think it is very important for Saudi Arabia uh, to go through this exercise, actually, of competitiveness. Uh, Saudi Arabia have jumped last year in the IMD report and the competitiveness report 13 steps up. We were at 39, and we jumped up to 26. This year, we made uh, two more leaps, which is actually excellent. We're very excited. In this tough times, we really needed some good news. And I think um, a, a very big portion of our progress in competitiveness is because we had it in the heart of uh, our vision 2030. For the first time, Saudi Arabia had a vision uh, in 2016 where the Crown Prince actually gathered the uh, government entities and the private sector to draft this vision. In the heart of the vision, we, we aim to be 
uh, on the top 10 competitive uh, countries globally. But for us to do that, we had to institutionalize this work. We had to build an organization that actually works with government entities, all the government entities, the ones who are going to be responsible for moving the agenda of the growth of the economy in Saudi Arabia, plus something very important that we haven't been used to doing in the past, which is involving the private sector with us. So we had them all on one table. We started with a committee that had several, maybe 10 to 15 government entities around the table. But then we've grown this uh, to become the National Competitiveness Center in the beginning of last year, 2019, where we actually now today have 50 government entities sitting with us on the same table. We meet every single Wednesday at one o'clock in the afternoon, plus the yeah. private sector. And so, and we've generated a, a good mechanism, a good engine to move the uh, agenda for the reforms in, in several uh, sectors and in, in different topics. And we've actually identified subcommittees uh, that will focus on one challenge and one obstacles, and we, we really run after it. So it takes the uh, institutional work. Uh, we've made sure that we've changed the um, legislative framework, the processes, and we got everybody engaged and uh, focused towards one target. And I think that is definitely part of our success. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Diego, I have a question for you. So you are a frequent advisor to international organizations, including, you know, a, a supranational organization in Washington, World Bank, IMF, and so on. Do you perceive that there is this trend towards deglobalization in which these global forces matter less and then government become more important? Or do you feel that there is still a future for globalization? Um, effectively, there is this trend of deglobalization. Protectionism is growing in, in the main economies. I mean, you, you, you open uh, any newspaper in the U.S. and you see the USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative, Mr. Dijkstra, uh, announcing just closing the borders, closing the economy, uh, protecting jobs in the U.S. And, and, and you see that also happening in, in Europe right now, massively in Europe uh, happening. And, and that's a reality. But, but uh, in, in, in practical terms, we have to see whether that is going to be a short-term issue or a real long-term. There are different issues. First of all, is this kind of deglobalization affecting uh, a trade of goods versus services? I mean, uh, I think goods, I mean, you can stop easily the, 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 the goods trade, but services a little bit more um, hard, especially in, in the new digital world. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you, you, you have to see, for example, the growth of the new trade of the world, which is data. Mm -hmm. Data is growing everywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the international traffic grew more than 40% just last month. So, mm -hmm. so basically, the, 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 the trade cannot be stopped. There is an international crisis. You see what it is happening today with the UTO. Mm -hmm. Here, for example, regionally in Latin America, there is not even one international institution, trade institution working. Mercosur is not working. The Andean Pact is not working. Uh, the, the, uh, all the institutions that were created are not uh, coping with the reality nowadays. But there is going to be new leaders. The U.S. and Europe are starting to kind of uh, giving space to new players such as China. You see that with the TPP. The U.S. backed off from, from, from the TPP and, and, and the new countries said we want to have a new TPP, which is the CPT, CPTPP, and China is saying, ah, I want to be part of that. And, and, and the big one comes to, 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 to lead that. So, so I think there is going to be a deglobalization in the short run. Uh, uh, especially, uh, you know, kind of forced by the populism uh, of, 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 uh, that, that the crisis is, is bringing. But uh, the crisis is just accelerating the process. It, it was coming before the crisis. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but I think what, what is going to happen in a few years is that, that this is going to be a reaccommodation. But globalization is going to be there. It's going to be there by just one simple thing. People, we are global. Look at mm -hmm. us now here. 
You know, we are people from all over the world. When I was a teenager, when I was growing in a small town in Colombia, I basically didn't know anybody who, who lived outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you see the same people as me in my hometown, which is a poor town in the Colombian mountains, with 200,000 inhabitants, 100,000 of them, they have at least one international contact in their social networks. So what I mean is that that's part of the new culture. The, the, and, and that globalization starts with people, connecting people, and we're already connected. So mm -hmm. we, we may have a bump, a bump in, in this globalization, but in the in, in two years, we're gonna back, we're gonna be back to 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 the uh, all numbers in, in trade of good services, money, and people. Hmm. I like your optimism. So thank you, hmm. uh, Alexander. So uh, Finland this year jumps two positions in the ranking, but also all the Nordic countries are in the top 15, top 20. Uh, and besides small countries like Finland or Switzerland, Austria, the Netherlands, who have countries like Singapore, Taiwan, who are doing extremely well. Um, and this is interesting because in our methodology, we favor big countries. That is, we should expect big countries like the US to do, to do better. What do you think are the reasons why small countries, they are more successful, respective to the political system? What, what are the advantages of being a small country? Well, I think in these types of crises, there's some advantage in the fact that you end up being quite agile, you end up being quite flexible. At the same time, you're extremely dependent about global megatrends. Um, if you look at some of the top countries there, say top 15 and the smaller ones, many of them are actually members of the European Union, some also uh, members uh, of the Eurozone. So in that sense, you could say that they're part of a bigger economy mm -hmm. um, as such and it would be interesting to perhaps do a comparison between you know the competitiveness of china the competitiveness of the us and then the competitiveness of the european union and, and we've talked about uh, this before um, i think one of the reasons that a lot of the nordic countries and perhaps countries with similar tendencies than the nordic countries say for instance austria the netherlands belgium luxembourg canada uh, New Zealand, Australia, why they succeed is, is, is they're pretty much open uh, welfare states. Uh, they are very transparent in the way in which they deal with things. They're very globally oriented. Uh, they're very competitive um, in many ways. And, and, and this, I think, helps them a lot. Mm -hmm. But if, if you allow me, I mean, I'd like to take issue with, with excellent comments that Diego made and the question you had about, you know, is this the end of globalization? My, my answer is no. I actually think it's something like globalization 2.0 or globalization 3.0. What we're seeing because of COVID is a reduction in what can be traditionally called physical globalization. Um, We lost Alex for a few seconds. He may be back. No problem. I will give as 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 I was being back. cut off. I was saying that we're seeing a difference. That we we're seeing a reduction in physical globalization but an increase in virtual globalization. Yes. That is provided that your Wi-Fi at home works. <laughs> uh, so we have to be careful. So you're probably going to see a little bit less of Ricardo type of philosophy in the future and, and probably a change uh, in, in the basic value change. People are going to be a little bit more careful about where masks are going to be produced in, in the future, where syringes are going to be produced, where pills are going to be produced. So some people will go native. Also, a second point on this, I've been trying to think hard about this sort of state versus market debate, which is mm -hmm. at the core of globalization as well. Mm -hmm. And the way in which I try to put it into my little head is to say that in 1989, end of the Cold War, this was when the pendulum swung towards the market. You know, communism collapsed, obviously. Um, you know, market economy and capitalism became the the name the game in town. And actually, your competitive index started in 1989 
So it was all about market and competition, right? Yes. And I think the pendulum started to swing. And, you know, Europe wanted to be the most competitive economy in the world within 10 years and so on and so forth. Then the, then the pendulum started to swing, I think, with the financial crisis in 2008. Because that was the moment when basically sovereigns had to start bailing out banks and later central banks had to bail out sovereigns. And I think COVID has also been uh, a shift towards the state. And, and this will last for a little while. But Arturo, don't worry. Your competitive index will be as important as ever in the next mm -hmm. 32 years. And the yes. pendulum will swing back to market again. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. And, but indeed, you know, one of the claims that we're making is, is that if there is anything that the COVID-19 crisis shows is that our ranking, and especially this idea of competitiveness at the country level, that is the, the, the ways how governments you know, determine the fate of nations, but also the fate of companies, is actually more important than ever. Because as we have seen, you know, the, 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 what marks differences in 2020 among countries is also the way how governments have responded to the, to the crisis. And that's probably actually that's probably the, the topic that I want to address in in this second round of of questions. Let, let me talk a little bit about the future because obviously our ranking does, tries to be forward looking, and then we try to assess to which ten countries are going to be successful. And and the event of the moment is that we have a pandemic and a subsequent recession. So I think it would be interesting to also discuss for our audience what do you think are going to be the key success factors in in the future and. So let me take it back to, to Eamon here as well. So, Your Excellency, what do you think are going to be the key success factors for Saudi, but also for any country in the Middle East, for example, lo looking forward? The, the region has suffered strongly from this crisis, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of the, the oil prices and the oil crisis. So what do you think are going to be the key success factors for the future? If you have to give advice to our audience from many different countries, what would be your advice? Very good. Uh, actually, in this crisis, we have learned a lot. Uh, and it was a very good stress test. Not that we wanted it, but actually it worked uh, quite well for us. So we took advantage of what happened in um, finding out what opportunities we can come out with. So there are foundations in any economy uh, to improve your competitiveness. You have to have, you know, easing off the the business environment was something very crucial. The infrastructure is very important and will keep being there. But then you look at the digital economy as a whole and, and inclusiveness of the economy. And Saudi Arabia actually went through so many stages. But in the past few years, we have been moving forward very fast, very rapidly in, 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 the, in the inclusiveness agenda and how we improved actually our uh, uh, infrastructure and how we have improved our labor market and what have you. But one very important thing that I just you know want to point out to that it, it actually deserves um, just a, a moment the way we have included 50% of our nation back into the, the market again, the economy, females. So we have lifted all the restrictions on females in Saudi Arabia. So we've allowed a huge number of talent to get into the market, which was amazing. Uh, and we've really lifted all the restrictions. So now they can compete equally with uh, their uh, fellow males. So that's one thing. During this crisis actually gave us an opportunity to review all the businesses that we're doing, to review all the government efficiencies. Uh, are we fully automated? Are we not? What, where are our gaps? Um, when we had to, to be locked down, all of us, could we actually survive and for how long? Do we have all our applications serving our people uh, in terms of all the supply chain of food, medicine, what have you? How is our education system? Can we switch to online education? How is our healthcare system? Do we have what we need during this time and, and after? So it was really a very good stress test, but that also made us think, what's next? What's after this crisis? Are we going to switch our businesses to home businesses? Are we going to enable more of the new talent to get into the market and new businesses? How are we going to develop our e-commerce? You know, we were moving into our e-commerce, we've developed our laws, but, but then what? You know, do we have the whole ecosystem? Do we have the, the uh, logistics uh, support, uh, do we have all the infrastructure that we need for the e-commerce and, and what have you? So, and can we change all the legislation? Can we ease off more of the restrictions? And we immediately actually, we had a very big project with the World Bank where we actually looked at uh, the uh, licensing regime in Saudi Arabia to mm -hmm. start and operate and close your business. But then I went one more round with them to say, okay, we've, we've actually knocked down 50% of our uh, 
um, you know, regulations to issue a, a license, but how can we do more? How can we do 30% more since a lot of businesses will move to the home businesses, uh, virtual work will, will step in. The government also looked at how are we going to operate from a distance as well. Do we need all our resources to be in offices? How we, can we cut costs and use that for other projects to build the uh, investment, to build more investments in the infrastructure and what have you? So there was actually a lot of opportunity and we should continue looking into it and we should not just you know, be lazy and laid back again once everything is open again. This was actually a very good experience for, it, for us and lessons learned for the world to actually shift where we were to where we want to be in the future. And, and I think it's good to have this type of role models. Uh, Absolutely. Of, of, Absolutely. Of policies. So, and I, I, Diego, you mentioned earlier the importance of data. And I think um, Iman has also mentioned this aspect as well of technology. Um, we have seen during this crisis that uh, technology plays a fundamental role. I mean, we are now, thank God, connected via technology. And we're doing this webinar because we have the technology to do so. Um, to what extent do you think that technology will be a competitive advantage of nations? And how is this going to change after 2020 and because of the COVID-19? What do you think? Of course, technology is going to be a, a key tool uh, for the competitiveness of countries in, in today and in the future. And, and, and if you see, for example, Latin America, a good example is Uruguay. Again, a small economy that has improved a lot thanks to technology. The results of Uruguay are really, really fantastic. This country had 32% of people in poverty in, in 2006, and it decreased poverty to 8%. Uh -huh. uh, and then and GDP per capita grew from $4,000 to $17,000. Why? Because they have different, different key success uh, factors. The first one is, uh, for me, the use of technology. It was the first country deploying technology to every child in every school, but not only internet. 80% uh, uh, of the of, of homes in Uruguay, they have fiber, whereas the average of Latin America is just 15%. Uh, every school is connected. Every student is connected. Every student has a computer. But not only that, they also change the mentality on how to use technology. So now with the crisis, they, they move easily to remote education. I mean, it was, it was just one step, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see how they use technology to improve the agriculture. And so they, have, they, they are number one in the ag tech world in, in this part of the world. They are number one in terms of government using technology. So, so basically, uh, my, my fear now is whether or not the Matthew effect is going to be taking place. The Matthew effect, which is the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poorer, you know, from, from, mm -hmm. the, from the Matthew, the, 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 the book of the Bible. So, so basically, the thing is, uh, do we have people ready for this new world? And I think mm -hmm. the most important issue is what it is very, very clear shown in your report on talent, the IMD competitive uh, uh, report on, on talent, talent is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the single most important advice is reskilling. Reskill your people in your country, reskill your people in your company, reskill yourself. Mm -hmm. True. And indeed, indeed, you know, if you look at the, the failures in our rankings, countries that have not uh, managed to, to become competitive despite their potential. I'm thinking, for example, Brazil. They have done so because they forgot talent management in the first place. And technology as well, but primarily, you know, the role of education at promoting, for example, digital transformation. That's, uh, that, that, that's very important. I, I want to ask you, this will be my final question, but I want to start with, with Alex because you all have policy experience, and in particular, Alex, you have been uh, holding different responsibilities in, in, at different levels. So if you had to give advice now to a politician in any country uh, that is suffering, I'm Spanish, so let me put me, myself in the shoes of a, of, a, of a minister in Spain, you know, what would be the advice that you give to any top-level politician today on how to cope with the pandemic? and the subsequent recession 
that this has cost? What would be your priorities and your advice in general? Well, I guess the first advice is to say that, you know, you will be judged on the basis of three criteria. Criteria number one is rather morbid. It's basically the death toll and the infection toll. Uh, and uh, there will be scapegoats. So that means that when you're in government in the beginning, perhaps they rallied around your flag, but towards the end, they're going to start blaming you. Uh, that's just a fact of, of politics. The second one is how quickly can you get your economy to bounce back? Uh, and I'll get a little bit more into detail uh, on that mm -hmm. because we don't know whether this is a V curve, an L curve, a W, a U, or, or, or a combination uh, of the uh, above. And of course, for any politician, say in a democratic country, in an election cycle, if you're three years away from the election, you know, it could be quite tricky. Um, if you are say, five months away from an election, you can understand why Donald Trump is behaving the way in which he is. I'd be pretty scared as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 not looking, it's not looking good. Uh, thirdly, I would say you will be judged on how you communicate this. Uh, and, and this is, of course, where you've seen this sort of global war between, you know, China, the U.S. and, and many others and, and how well you're able to communicate yourself out of this crisis because it's a communication crisis as well. So those are the three big things that you have to keep in your mind. What would I give as an advice to a Spanish minister at the moment? I would give him or her five pieces of advice. Number one, the most important thing is health and your healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you put enough resources into that and make sure that the system is, is working. I think a lot of countries succeeded with that in the beginning. That's why the lockdown came because you wanted to have hospitals that could maintain um, a, a serious pandemic. Uh, number two, uh, don't save on social security. This is the moment when you really have to become as socialist as you possibly can and as Keynesian as you possibly can. Uh, number three, when you've done that, use the crisis for structural change and competitiveness because you're going to need that. If you want your economy to grow at some stage, you're basically going to have to turn it around and never, ever waste a good crisis. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I hate to say this, I was a crisis minister because I was in government from eight years, from 2008 to 2016. I was foreign minister, trade minister, finance minister, and, and prime minister. And of course, I say that when I began, everything started to go really bad. <laughs> when I left, Finland was starting to do well again. So don't re-elect me for anything. I mean, that's my basic message in Finland. But the bottom line is that we had to push tough structural change through during the financial crisis. Number four is what uh, Diego and Ayman touched upon earlier, uh, is technology. That, you know, that is what drives the world. It, you know, if, if your population doesn't have, uh, you know, broadband, if it doesn't have technologically savvy stuff, you're going to fall behind, you know. We, we're not living in a, in a sort of an old type of a physical world anymore. You need to be tech savvy to, to, to get out of this crisis. And finally, and for education, you know, you need to, to have a sort of a new, how would I say, education class, which is taught in a completely different way. Uh, I'm often asked, you know, what should my kids study or what should I study? I say, listen, and I have a 16-year-old and 18-year-old. So I say, listen, focus on three things. Number one, learn how to analyze things. It's not about memorizing anymore. It's about bringing different concepts in together. So go broad, go liberal arts, go science, learn how to analyze. Number two, learn how to take care of yourself. And that means your body and your mind, because you're probably going to be self-employed in one way or another for most of your life, or certainly you're not going to have a classic career uh, anymore. Uh, and then number four, uh, uh, go for empathy. In other words, learn how to communicate and be with other people. But now I see that the picture has frozen off again and I might have been cut off. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. It looks like a competitiveness playbook. So very interesting. I don't know if Eamon or Diego, you have any other comment about that? Diego, go ahead. I, I just uh, would add one item, which is empower your mayors, empower your regional leaders. Because the, 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 I mean, the, I mean, you can compare like a small country with it, with it, with it, with a city or with a region. 
And I think the improvement in, comp in, the improvement in competitiveness is coming from, from high, dense places with uh, economies of scope, with economies of scale. Uh, there is actually a very good recent book by, by the former mayor of Chicago, The City Nation, that, that shows exactly that. And, and I think if, if, uh, if I was going to give an advice to a, a, a president of a big country, I would tell him that, empower local people. Mm -hmm. And so, Ayman, you want to add something as well? I actually I wanted to... I would give the to... advice that fix the broadband in my... I would give, I would give the advice that fix <laughs> the broadband in my neighborhood. I, <laughs> I, I, just, I just actually moved back on, on, on 4G because I don't trust my broadband anymore. Mm -hmm. I hope I got cut off where I said... Me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Arturo, no, what I wanted to say actually for countries like Saudi Arabia, sometimes I totally agree with everything that has been said about talent because I think that is, that is the most crucial mm -hmm. uh, element in any economy that you really have to build your talent and build an agile talent as well that, uh, and, and skill them and reskill them and, and just don't, don't stop. But meanwhile, and for a country like Saudi Arabia, where we're actually heading towards a very big agenda on diversification of the economy and weaning ourselves off from oil, I think the uh, the talent needs to be developed, but meanwhile, doing, during this transition period, we will have to import a lot of know-how. The FDI will help a lot in, in Saudi Arabia, and that's why we're working very hard on the business environment, really making it easy for investors to come and invest, uh, making sure that our policies and our laws are very predictable, are very transparent. This will help bring the know-how in, diversify our economy while we're building our talent and bridging the gap. I think that is also very crucial. Excellent. We have, we have lots of questions, uh, and uh, I'm just going through the questions. And there is one that I'm particularly interested in, actually, that I like that the audience is asking. And I would like to have a, a short answer from you, because Alex talked about now it's the time to be socialist. <clears throat> and we have this struggle in our rankings. What about taxes? That is, is, do you think it's the time for high taxes or low taxes? Because for one, low taxes, you know, facilitate business creation and so on, but at the same time, we need high taxation to just satisfy the needs of the system. So what is your take on that? What would be your opinion again? High taxes, low taxes? Uh, Ayman, you want, to, you want to start? Actually, um I, uh, what I, you know, what Saudi Arabia has done recently is actually it has increased the uh, VAT to to fifteen percent, and that is actually again to cope with the crisis. We have uh, brought in a lot of stimulus packages, so the the government have actually introduced more than one hundred public sector initiatives uh, with uh, around thirty five billion dollars to help the economy during this time. But we've also increased the taxes for the time being, so to take us through this crisis and for the government to, to survive longer. And hopefully that will uh, we will gain some benefits from it. But uh, again, you know, I'd like to hear from the rest. Mm -hmm. Alex. Well, it's an eternal question. I hope the Finnish media is not listening because then they'll take this as some kind of advice to the Finnish uh, government, which it's not. I'm not giving any advice to the sitting Finnish government. Uh, I think it's the you know eternal question. Uh, do you raise taxes or do you lower taxes? Do you cut public expenditure? Or do you increase public expenditure? in these types of situations. I still say as a first measure, use this moment to go for uh, structural changes. Structural changes which have to do perhaps uh, with uh, your employment market, mm -hmm. structural changes which has to do with the overall balance between public expenditure and private expenditure. Uh, the big worry I have in some countries which are actually quite highly ranked uh, in uh, your rankings, competitive rankings, is that their public expenditure ratio is extremely high. So basically every cent paid as tax goes, not every cent, but say 60% goes to, um, to, 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 to public expenditure versus then, then private. So you have to be very careful on that. I would probably, you know, right now focus on reducing taxes that have to do with private companies and that have to do uh, with, um, with uh, work. And I might actually increase it a little bit on consumption, but it would have to be an extremely mm -hmm. careful tweak. Uh, we're not going to mm -hmm. get out of this crisis, uh, you know, with, with, through tax policy. It's going to have to be 
much, much more. Because as we well know, this is both the supply side and the demand mm -hmm. side crisis. And in that sense, you're going to have to use you know, every, every club in the bag. Um, my big worry here is that, you know, I've been quite tough on austerity uh, over the years in the sense that I, I feel that, you know, you need to have a balanced budget and I feel that your debt to GDP ratio needs to stay within the limit, say, you know, 60 percent and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. My big worry right now is that there seems to be this sort of, you know, uh, printing cash on steroids coming from central banks and at some stage uh, the system will will have to sort of revamp itself and someone will have to pay this back at some stage and i, I just don't you know we, we're building almost like a pyramid of trust where where my my my, my worries come but i you know mm -hmm. taxing is not going to be the solution and and uh, it, it, it's not going to mm -hmm. you, you can't give one answer to 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 every country and say you need to increase this tax and reduce mm -hmm. that one so in that sense, I'm with Ayman on this. You have to be very specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Diego. Uh, I'm, not a, a, I'm not a tax expert, but, but I, I can say two things. The first one is, um, you know, keep taxes in order to improve competitiveness. And, and you have investors, international investors. If you raise taxes, and you, you may get out of the picture for investors. But and, and the second issue, this is the opportunity to rethink public expenditure. So the, 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 the focus on what it is really important, uh, focus on, 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 on cleaning up a little bit government expenditure, you know, focus on, on things that are going to, in, in the case of the developing world, things that are going to close gaps and, and improve competitiveness. Uh, so I think the problem is not only in tax collection, and it, is, it is on how we spend those, those taxes, and it is the mm -hmm. moment to rethink how we are doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is a, also another question that, since it applies to all of you, I would like to hear your opinion. It's about people, movement of people, because we're talking about globalization, and we're talking about trade, and we have talk about movement of data. But one of the things that we have seen in the last years, and I'm thinking particularly of Europe, in Europe, but also the United States, is that we're building walls against people. And what do you think should be the role of immigration? What, what should be the attitude of governments towards immigrants, especially when they come from poorer countries and poorer communities? And I'm thinking of really Colombia, Finland, but also Saudi Arabia. What do you think should be the attitude of governments towards immigration? Alex, do you want to start now? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, my starting point is openness. Um, I'm a very strong believer that all great nations or all great areas in this world have been built on migratory movements. And then it's a question of whether and how you're able to control those migratory movements. We had a wonderful webinar um, on Monday uh, with at the School for Transnational Governance uh, with uh, the Commissioner for Justice and Home Affairs, Ilva Johansson, and then mm -hmm. uh, Antonio Vittorino, um, and the African Commissioner as well. And, and I had a long conversation about this. And I think in Europe, one of the big problems is that because our asylum crisis in 2015 was so difficult to deal with, this has sort of brought some kind of a stigma on migratory movements, which it, it, it really shouldn't. Uh, you know, the United States was built on migration, right? Uh, Europe has been built on migration, and, and, and we just need to deal with it. Um, and to all of those people, actually, I don't think there are many listening to this today, but who, who really want to build these walls and, 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 and go native and anti-globalist, nationalist, racist, uh, and, and the rest of it, uh, you know, the, the, tr the Trumpian of this world, if you will. I mean, just think about what your life has been like during COVID-19. That is what closing borders actually means. That is what it does to the economy. Mm. That it does what it does to your job. That is what it does to your health. And then rethink again whether globalization is a bad thing or a good thing. This is yeah. building walls. Mm. True. Hey, man, what do you think about immigration? 
Um, I think this is one of the uh, topics that we we definitely have to uh, you know spend some time on. I personally think Saudi Arabia has over eight million workers, expat workers, which is huge. But what kind of workers are they? The subject matter experts that we want to have in our country or not? They're about, most of them are the you know quote unquote the cheap labor, the the the, the blue collar uh, workers. But what we need in, in this. The time of uh, Saudi Arabia going through this transformation, a huge transformation. And as I said, we need to diversify our economy. We need to bring this know-how. We need to bring the subject matter experts. It takes 10,000 hours, as Professor Hosman says, to actually transfer knowledge from one person to the, uh, to the other. So it's, it's almost 13 years. While you can actually immigrate this knowledge and know-how in six or seven hours across the border, but how can we make it easier for them to migrate and be part of the society and be part of the development, not only to come for two years and then they go away again and they take their knowledge with them. And luckily in our vision, this was one of the targets that we were aiming for, to bring this, this know-how uh, and, and to transfer this, this knowledge uh, to, to the kingdom, to diversify our economy quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Diego, uh, uh, what is your thank opinion? You, Arturo. Uh, look, I'm Colombian and, and, and we've been immigrants. For, for, for many years, but lately in the last few years, we've received almost 2 million Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we are, uh, and, and it is so interesting because th there have been basically three different waves of Venezuelan migration. The first one was rich Venezuelans that came to Colombia to invest. And we were very happy, very happy. I mean, some people were not because real estate price went up, you know? And then the second wave came with professionals, well-educated people that moved to Colombia to work in companies. I hired 16 of them. I was very happy working as a minister with a very good team of good professional Venezuelans. We were very happy. But then poor people came, One more, almost 1.8 million people, poor people from Venezuela. And then that's when the social problems came. And that's, that's what we don't like. That's what, when the social a, a clash happened between Venezuelans and Colombian and discrimination started and so on and so forth. So it all depends. It all depends. Of course, we all want the good people and we all want the, good, the, the, the money, but we have to take into consideration human rights. We have to take into consideration what, uh, what, what is happening uh, down there with people starving. And you see that in your report now, in this report. Venezuela is the very last country of the report. Uh, so, so, so this is, uh, 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 so it all depends. It all depends on, on what kind of migration you have and the reasons why you have. However, in this last wave, uh, we have to say, for example, there are industries like the coffee, Coffee has improved a lot thanks to that migration. Why? Because Colombians didn't want to, to go pick up coffee beans. And now Venezuelans are happy to do that job. Even, even in this developing world, we have internal uh, effects, of positive effects, even, even of that uh, a poor immigration. Mm, excellent. Dear Ayman, dear Diego, and dear Alexander, thank you very much. Uh, we are we're about to, to finish right in time. Yes, I want you to summarize a little bit what we have discussed in, in four points. I have learned a lot. But if I had to summarize in big headlines what we have been discussing, I think number one, I think countries need to have a strategy, especially in the post-pandemic era. That strategy involves leadership, communication, having a certain choices that countries have, have to make. Um, it is the time for, let me call it, true populism. Okay, I will not say socialism, but probably true populism, in which I think policies have to put people at the forefront. And promoting prosperity, that is promoting competitiveness, should be the ultimate objective of our policies in, in the recession. Um, I think globalization, and this you know, has changed a little bit my original mindset, but I think globalization is, is at least coming back. So it's, it's not something that we have lost. We have a backlash on globalization because of the current crisis, but we will go back to our uh, trade of services, goods, data, and people in the long run. And in that sense, openness remains a key asset for countries, including openness to, to goods and services, but open, also openness to people. And finally, I think you all have stressed this importance of talent and talent management as a key to long-term survival and sustainability of economies. And I, I, I leave you with that, and I leave everybody with that, because I think that 
you know, what we have seen in the last years in the IMD World Competitiveness Center is only those countries that promote this long-term reform, particular education, health, scientific infrastructure, and so on, they succeed. So we, it is time for short-term policies to, to, to cure the injuries from the pandemic, but I think we also need, as Alex said, long-term reforms. And it is time also to be a reformist and then to make the changes, that, the structural changes that our economies need. Okay. On that front, I'm going, to, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you. Uh, we had many questions, I think we answered most of them, but it has been extremely highlighting and interesting. So thank you everybody for listening and thank you to our panelists for being with us today. Thank you for having us, Arturo. Thank you for the invitation, Arturo. My it's pleasure. pleasure. Thank you, Artur. I hope you go cycling after this. I will. Yes, me too. <laughs>